Hello, this is the writer of False Wipe Gaming. My name is BKC, and I'm back again to advertise my own channel, first of all, which is sure to appeal to you if you like these types of videos, but also to tell you the tale of another great defensive Pokemon, because I love great defensive Pokemon, and I find their style of play fascinating. You may have heard me on this channel before, where I told you about how great Skarmory, Chansey, and Blissey were. Today we're going over another such paragon of defensive aptitude, but one that's made its name in the lower tiers, Lantern. Before players even knew what a lower tier was, however, then you Lantern is one of the most colorfully fun additions from Generation 2, boasting an intriguing design that meant it had unique water electric typing. Today, we're going to be examining how this happy anglerfish fared in the competitive scene. So, we ask, how good was Lantern actually? From day one, the first thing that stood out about Lantern was its uniquely complementary dual typing. On one hand, being half electric meant that Lantern was a water type that couldn't withstand earthquakes, which already meant that it could not be used in the same way one would use other waters. On the other hand, being half electric also meant that Lantern was a water type that completely dominated other water types, and that it was a water type not weak to opposing electric moves. Furthermore, Lantern being an electric type that was also part water meant that ground types wouldn't want to switch into its electric moves. Lantern's interest was not just in its typing though, it also possessed an absolutely enormous base 125 HP stat that, alongside a serviceable special defense stat, made it quite a tanky special wall. Lantern special attack wasn't great, but it had two of the best stabs in the game, blessed with both power and coverage in Surf and Thunder or Thunderbolt, which compensated for it. Lantern's subpar speed and physical defense, alongside stringent electric type competition, meant it wasn't going to fit into OU at all. UU had several excellent electrics as well, from the offensive ferocity of the speedy Electabuzz to the well rounded blend of hitting hard and defensive utility of Ampharos and Magneton. Did this mean Lantern, with its comparatively low offensive output, was outclassed? Not at all. In fact, Lantern not only found a niche, but was absolutely excellent in UU, fulfilling a thoroughly valuable, unique niche that made it one of the most singular Pokemon in the tier. It was a superb special wall, easily able to withstand powerful hits from speedy, dangerous attackers like Electabuzz's Thunders and Kadabra and Mr. Mime's Psychics. It was outstanding at playing the long game, so characteristic of GSCUU as well. With Rest Talk, it shrugged off hits and status while remaining offensively threatening, especially with Thunder's nasty 30% paralysis rate that ruined or at least severely hindered even Pokemon that could take its hits, like Blossom and Victory Bell. Even the slow Chansey didn't much appreciate being paralyzed, as the free turns it could lose by virtue of full paralysis could be game-changing, and thus it was often provoked into burning heal bell PP. All this made Lantern terrific team support, as did its excellent matchups against opposing bulky Pokemon. It could safely stalemate the otherwise irritating Hypno, its enormous HP stat leaving it rather unperturbed by seismic tosses, and it completely dominated the ubiquitous Slowbro and Slowking, as well as Omastar. It was really only bulky Pokemon that wanted to take Lantern's hits, too. Offensive Pokemon wouldn't want to take its stab moves based off their power and Thunder's para rate, which one couldn't even safely avoid since the popular ground types, Nidoqueen, Piloswine, Sandslash, and Gligar, didn't want to eat Lantern's Surf. These grounds were also pretty much the only Pokemon that actually immediately threatened Lantern, too. The only other Pokemon that could threaten damage that even came close were the likes of Scyther, Granbull, and Dodrio, which were all, of course, slammed by Thunder. Since the few offensive Pokemon that actually threatened it couldn't actually switch in, and since the bulky Pokemon that could actually take Lantern's hits didn't actually threaten it much in return, Lantern was intensely difficult, to the point of near impossibility, to switch into without slowing the game's pace down. This made Lantern excellent at resetting momentum to its team's advantage, or preventing the opponent from mounting any sort of momentum to try and regain footing. All in all, the niche Lantern possessed in GSUU was was as valuable as it was unique, and it was a significant help in carving out the metagame's identity and character. Generation 3 bestowed abilities upon the Pokemon world, and Lantern got an amazing one in Volt Absorb, providing it with an immunity to electric so powerful it actually replenished its HP. In a metagame with so many dangerous offensive water types, from Raindance Omastar to Walren to Sharpedo, as well as the terror that was the offensive electric onslaught of Electabuzz and Manectric, Lantern utilized its fantastic bulk and typing, with its ice resistance proving particularly uniquely useful against Walren, to carve out one of the best, most important defensive roles in the tier. Its resilience in the face of the threats it was to take on was absolutely stellar, often feeling borderline immovable for how seemingly impossible it was for them to break through. Even super effective hidden power grasses bounced off Lantern's huge bulk. Lantern wasn't just a passive wall either. It was infuriatingly obnoxious to switch into, with its excellent stabs complemented nicely by the toxic protect combo that ruined bulkier walls while helping Lantern leverage every bit of leftovers it could to remain healthy without having to use rest. Of course, it could drop toxic in favor of Ice Beam to utterly destroy any Altaria 
that thought it could sit on it, while also stinging Vileplume hard. Lantern was so good defensively, in fact, partially because it was so effortlessly effective offensively. It was able to take its hit-taking ability and turn it into an opportunity to threaten the opponent, which is ideal for a defensive Pokemon. Its plethora of positive matchups provided it great in-battle flexibility for both withstanding the opponent's threats while making progress against them. Though it didn't dominate entire teams with the flash of Kangaskhan or Scyther, Lantern was an outstanding, important piece of Gen 3 UU. For many teams looking to overload the opponent with blistering special offense, they often faced no greater roadblock than the Anglerfish. For a long, long time, Lantern was considered unviable in OU. Its appealing anti-water and electric traits were overshadowed by its complete lack of longevity in OU's permanent sand metagame. As a wall, Lantern was entirely inferior to Blissey. However, eventually, twas discovered that Lantern did have a genuine OU niche if you didn't use it as a wall. Lantern went the way of one of Advance's most iconic water types, Suicune, which found new life in the tier when its all bulk image was turned on its head in favor of offensive sets that blasted through the opponent. With this newly aggressive approach, Lantern created a unique niche for itself that Blissey could not replicate. This niche was partially rooted in its ability to reliably take on certain offensive threats famous for their ability to dominate offensive teams having little in the way of switch-ins. Most notably, Starmie, but also a range of other beasts like Zapdos, Jolteon, several Suicune variants, Mixed Salamence, Moltres, Charizard, sometimes even Gengar. Well, Blissey could also handle these. So what did Lantern do to distinguish itself? It took on these offensive threats and turned them into opportunities to fire off its own uniquely dangerous offensive assault. You thought Jolteon or Zapdos had a free Thunderbolt with three layers of spikes down? Uh-oh. Lantern comes in. You just healed off that spikes damage for it, and you have to switch into its dangerous offensive arsenal now. Blissey could never. You thought Starmie was a guarantee to KO each time it came in against Spike's offense teams as it usually did? Not only was that not the case with Lantern, but it also threatened Starmie's team in return. Charizard's Focus Punch or Mix Mence's Brick Break prevented Blissey or Tyranitar from checking it? Lantern didn't care. Moltres dished out a Will-O-Wisp? Not a problem. Unlike the physically oriented Snorlax, Lantern was still offensively threatening while burned. HP Grass? Not doing enough to be immediately dangerous. Lantern wasn't supposed to be a permanently unwavering wall, of course. It was supposed to plug defensive holes in teams while threatening the opposition and making progress in return. To this end, Lantern was usually on Spike's teams, both helping their usual defensive deficiencies against the aforementioned threats while being helped by them to be more of an offensive threat itself. It was surprisingly strong with offensive investment, but it still appreciated the extra push against grounded Pokemon. It was a great Spike's partner, though, since it had positive matchups against every Spike's immune Pokemon, so if you wanted to counter it, you'd be taking Spike's damage. Though HP Grass was its standard to smash through Swampert, Lantern could also use Confuse Ray. With Spike's down, this could deny Blissey's Soft Boiled, making Lantern even more of a dangerous wall-breaking threat. And if Blissey couldn't handle it, nothing else on the opposing team was going to love taking on Lantern back by Spikes either. Of course, Lantern had its flaws, primarily its low defense and earthquake weakness. However, the players that propped up Lantern as legitimate, the Lantern Gang as they were known, were proved by time to be correct. At long last, Lantern's potential had been turned into a genuine OU niche, one that was even legitimized by actual tournament success. In Generation 4, Lantern received its first offensive boosting option in Charge Beam. This, coupled with its 101 HP substitutes unbroken by a single seismic toss from Blissey, technically gave it a small OU niche as a stall breaker, as other stall Pokemon would not want to take its boosted attacks. The problem was that in a permanent sand metagame, and with Lantern's low special attack requiring several boosts before it was sufficiently threatening, this would not work out in practice. Especially since the ubiquitous Stealth Rock meant it wouldn't even start at 100% health. Sure, you could help even the playing field with toxic spikes to wear Blissey down while Lantern set up, but Lantern still had to be incredibly precise with choosing its setup opportunity since its longevity was essentially nil, and it was still far from a done deal even if this was the case. There was a time where some popular stall teams did not automatically run sand, and yes, Lantern did threaten those. There was nothing more satisfying than seeing Lantern set up all over Blissey than proceed to run through its partners like Rotom Appliances, Gyarados, Fortress, and Heatran. Sadly, this was incredibly unreliable, and Lantern was quickly relegated to gimmick territory. However, as far as Generation 4 gimmicks go, it was one of the coolest. A lower tier special attacker beating Blissey is always a delight. Landred had another unique place in Generation 4's iteration of UU. Its usage and viability were lower than in the previous two generations, as other water types, mostly Milotic and Blastoise, were generally easier to use because of their lack of an earthquake weakness. A critical trait, given they were often tasked with handling physical attackers like Altaria and Rhyperior that were carrying the move. Lantern's earthquake weakness also meant, unlike 
these other waters, it was vulnerable to Dugtrio. Thus, Lantern was more difficult to slot on a team. However, when Lantern was used, it made full use of its unique traits. As a water type who effortlessly beat other water types thanks to its electric stab, this allowed it to force certain matchups and thus make progress in a different way. For example, it could force in Venusaur and land Paralysis on it, not even needing to slot Thunder Wave into its moveset since it could land this Paralysis reliably with the newly added Discharge. A paralyzed Venusaur was much more susceptible to being overwhelmed later on. Even Lantern's seemingly unthreatening Ice Beams would threaten it, and it'd go a long way in neutering Venusaur as an offensive threat. That was just if the Grass type was Venusaur too. If the Grass type was one that didn't like taking Ice Beams, like Torterra or Leafeon, then Lantern would threaten all three of the Fire Water Grass trio that characterized much of Gen 4 UU. And since these Pokemon were often paired with the bulky Ground type like Rhyperior or Donphan, suddenly it wasn't uncommon or strange for Lantern to threaten two thirds of an entire team, or perhaps even more, since it had such good matchups against two of the most common Pokemon used to tie such teams together, Miss Magius and Rotom. Lantern also had unique defensive use as a water type, since its electric typing allowed it to resist Moltres' secondary stab, Air Slash, while crucially not adding a quadruple weakness to HP Grass, as was the case for the water rock types that also resisted both Moltres stabs, Kabutops and Omastar. Finally, Lantern packed an incredible utility move other waters would kill for, Heal Bell. This was absolutely enormous in helping both itself and its teammates shrug off all the status flying around UU, especially since Lantern's great defensive profile ensured it had plenty of opportunities to use the move. All in all, Lantern was more niche, but was still a useful Pokemon in DPP UU. Lantern might get written off as Rotom Wash before the Industrial Revolution, but it actually managed to top cut a VGC Worlds before Rotom ever did, or more accurately, in tandem with it. In Gen 4, all Rotom forms were still ghost type, so Lantern's stab boosted water moves could actually compete with Rotom Wash's Hydro Pump, and it boasted better bulk. Japanese player Takushi Morikima, aka T Dom, followed up on his 2009 top 8 finish with another top 8 at 2010 Worlds in Kona, Hawaii, by using Lantern alongside Rotom. Rotom, Rotom Mo to be exact. We don't know exactly how this Lantern worked, but old Smogan threads tell us that T-Dom and Lantern quickly became infamous in Kona as they tore through the last chance qualifiers by spamming Discharge against Groudon and Rotom Mo. What one can assume is that this is an anti-weather Pokemon. Lantern could hit Kyogre and Groudon with each of its different stabs, and T-Dom's double weather team ensured that he could control the weather. Lantern's Ice-type coverage may have also let it handle opposing Hail Setters with Blizzard, and with another Electric-type on its team, it could make use of Volt Absorb to heal off Rotom's own discharges. But while Rotom would go on to win its first Worlds in washing machine form at the hands of Ray Rizzo just two years later, Lantern never again returned to the world stage. Gen 5 gave the Rotom forms their specialized typings, and Rotom Wash is the king of Rotom forms, so it makes sense that it would bully Lantern out of the spotlight. Lantern may have more bulk and more reliable water moves, but it's got worse special attacks, speed, support moves, and maybe most importantly, a worse ability. Volt Absorb was nothing to scoff at, of course, but Levitate is simply on a whole other level, like a level above the ground. For anyone to make Lantern work, they need to get truly weird with it, which we'll get to soon. Generation 5 gifted Lantern two incredible moves. One, Scald. Now it could dish out a new status in Burn as its Water Stab, and two, Volt Switch, giving it an incredible switch move that it could spam just as easily since Grounds would be terrified of Scald. The addition of Volt Switch didn't just work to Lantern's benefit there though. With Volt Absorb, Lantern could effortlessly put a stop to opposing Volt Switches. Now, Gen 5's infamous power creep meant it wasn't going to find a niche in UU, let alone OU, but that was just fine, as Lantern fit perfectly into the newly added RU, a tier that famously resembled DPP UU, except there was no Dugtrio. Lantern's resistance to Moltres' stab combination became even more crucial this time around, as Moltres' flying stab had been upgraded to the Mighty Hurricane. Moltres dominated RU, and Lantern was one of the few Pokemon capable of withstanding it. Lantern also completely stifled the immensely threatening Magneton, and helped check and pivot around all sorts of other dangerous threats, like Sigilyph, Shell Smash Omastar, Mesprit, and Iron Headlock Durant. Lantern's anti-bulky water quality shone as well, as it was able to switch into the popular waters of the tier, namely Slowking and Alomomola, and force them out. Lantern's outstanding defensive profile meant it became a momentum machine. It would switch in to counter a big threat, and then effortlessly use Volt Switch to safely bring in a threatening teammate. Lantern's low speed actually worked to its benefit with Volt Switch, because it meant its pivoting abilities weren't solely relegated to switches it forced. It could take a hit in a one-on-one -on -one before Volt Switching out. This was particularly nice against the irritating substitute bulk up Braviary. Furthermore, in addition to spamming irritating status of its own, sometimes using Toxic as well as Scald, 
Lantern's heal bell was superb in helping its own team shrug off status in the Scald and Toxic Heavy RU. What about Lantern's lack of reliable recovery, though? Not a problem. It also loved using Protect, which of course went hand in hand with racking up the residual damage it so easily spread on the opposing team. Lantern was absolutely amazing in Generation 5 RU. It checked the biggest threats, it helped bring in its own team's threats, it beat the biggest walls, it spread status, it healed status. It was just one of the best supporting Pokemon in the tier. Lantern saw some very limited use throughout 2013, but mostly with standard bulky sets. When it comes to differentiating Lantern from Rotom Wash, there are really only a few things it has going for it. Higher bulk, reliable water type move, its absorbabilities, and ice type coverage. Those who tried to make Lantern work took advantage of its access to Ice Beam or Blizzard to make it work as an anti-weather Pokemon, but that wasn't really enough to justify picking it, and it languished throughout Gen 5 without any good results. In Generation 6, Lantern once again dropped another tier thanks to Power Creep. And also, once again, it was utterly superb in that tier, which was Enu. Its tank set from Gen 5 RU was excellent once again. Its greatest defensive trait was handling the terrifying Magmortar, while also functioning as an effective stop to the tier's other dangerous fires in Pyroar and Charizard, while generally shrugging off the plethora of special attackers in the tier. Once it had hit the field, it could help itself and or its teammates shrug off the many status conditions flying around. And it was nightmarishly obnoxious to switch into it itself between the status dished out by Scald, possibly complemented further by Toxic, or its effortless Volt switching into a threatening teammate. This set alone would have made Lantern excellent, arguably elite, but it was the new additions it made to its game that cemented the status beyond a shadow of a doubt. Its most common set was not the tank, but one that took advantage of a new Gen 6 item, Assault Vest, giving a unique spin to the already unique Lantern. Yes, AV meant Lantern wouldn't be able to use Heal Bell and it'd lose the passive recovery of lefties, but it was worth it to enable the faster, more aggressive pace this set played at. The AV bolstering its special defense meant Lantern was plenty bulky and left room for it to invest in its special attack and speed. As a result, while still providing that all-important defensive utility, Lantern was now also directly, instantly offensively threatening, especially since it was running four attack moves. Scald and Volt Switch were a given with the utility they possessed even without a modicum of special attack investment, but with a modest nature and max investment, they stung the opponent with significant damage in addition to their other valuable attributes. In addition to this superb stab combination, Lantern also packed a powerful ice Beam for Vile Plume, and in the last slot often ran Hidden Power Fire for Pharaoh Seed and Obama Snow. However, it could also aim to ruin them with Scald Burns and run Hidden Power Grass instead, as that allowed it to destroy the Gastron that was immune to both its stabs. HP Grass also let it directly hit another one of the few Pokemon that could block its Volt Switch, opposing Lantern. Assault Vest made Lantern even easier to slap on a team that its tank set already did. They contributed so much on a game-to-game -game basis. Even that wasn't all Lantern could do either. If its team could afford to lose some of its tanking ability, they could reap the reward of Lantern at its most dangerous, wielding a choice spec set, whose solid power was augmented by its surprise factor, often allowing it to blast through something on the opposing team before the opponent even knew what was happening. No matter what set it chose, Lantern was a tremendous force in Gen 6 PU. In 2014, Lantern picked up one more advantage over Rotom, a very specific, very niche move available to only a few Pokemon in the game. I'm of course talking about Soak, and this was how Jason Artie Winja was able to give Lantern its first regional top cut ever. Artie was originally looking for a Soak Shedinja strategy to throw opponents off, but when researching the mons that got Soak, he was intrigued by Lantern's good coverage and started brainstorming other ways to make Soak work. What he landed on was completely unexpected, and the proof is in how well it tricked his opponents. Artie decided to use Choice Scarf Soak Lantern. The basic idea of the set was to pair it with a Mega Manectric. Mega Manectric's main problem is a lack of attacking options outside of electric moves, but once you douse the opponent in water, that doesn't become a problem anymore. Manectric could zap them with a Thunderbolt, or, to make things even more delightful, fire off a Discharge and heal Lantern in the process. Of course, for this strategy to work, Mega Manectric had to underspeed Lantern, and even with a Choice Scarf, a fish shape like that isn't outspeeding something as fast as Mega Manectric anytime soon. Artie intentionally specced his Manectric to be slow, giving it some bulk that actually let it live a decent amount of moves that would lose their stab once Lantern turned the other Pokemon into a water type. Soak was the highlight of this set, but all of Lantern's moves were threatening, and could utterly ruin unprepared opponents. Volt Switch could chunk Mega Charizard Y and get a positional advantage, especially if the Charizard was going for a Solar Beam. Hydro Pump would surprise opposing Rotom Heat, and Ice Beam coming off a Modest Lantern would KO Garchomp 94% of the time. To be clear, Rotom Wash can only do two of those things. It can't Ice Beam or Soak. So, Artie was able to find a niche in which Lantern could truly differentiate itself, and it paid off. He placed sixth at Seattle Regionals and gave Lantern one last standing for the history books. Since then, it's never showed up in VGC again, but beware, a Scarf Soak Lantern might be waiting for you at any moment. It's probably not, but it might be. 
another generation, another instance of power creep, another instance of lantern dropping a tier as a result, and another instance of lantern becoming a terrific defining force in the tier it had newly made its home in. In this case, lantern dropped a PU in generation 7, and surprise surprise, it was fantastic for all the reasons it had been for the previous two generations. The surrounding Pokemon had changed, but Lantern's innate traits remained valuable. It countered a slew of difficult to answer Pokemon like almost nothing else could. It effortlessly devoured the likes of Oricorio, Ghost, and Electric, Rotom Frost, and Simiseer. It helped play around threats like Aurorus, Alolan Raichu, and Omastar, and even helped pivot around the obnoxious kings of the tier, Electros and Jellicent. Once Lantern hit the field, as it so effortlessly did, it had an equally effortless time being irritating for the opponent to switch into, from its freewheeling Volt Switch pivots bringing in big threats for free to eternally crippling Scald Burns. Both its Assault Vest set and Tank set returned to form the crux of Lantern's viability in the tier, and they were just as effective as they had been prior, shrugging off powerful hits from Pokemon like Drampa while threatening an enormous portion of the tier in return. The AV set enjoyed the faster pace of the offensive teams whose defensive holes Lantern was often used to fix, and fix them it did easily, while the Tank set's access to Heal Bell was incredibly useful in a tier so irritated by Jellicent's Will-O-Wisp. Even Choice Specs made a return, and once again was prized for both its surprise factor and power. The latter ensured it was threatening even once the opponent knew it was Specs, but the initial surprise went a long way, shattering Pokemon like Gerger or Silverly Fairy that thought they could take its hits decently. Lantern could really do it all. Some players even experimented with a Choice Scarf set, differentiating itself from fellow Scarfed Electrics Alolan Raichu and Rotom Frost with its immunity to opposing Volt Switch and access to Heal Bell. It didn't catch on, but the niche was technically there, and the fact that a Pokemon with such low special attack and speed could actually run a viable Scarf set was testament to just how inherently effective Lantern was. Lantern was an outstanding, defining piece of Generation 7 PU. With its various DLC metagames, Generation 8 has been Lantern's most storiedly up and down since Generation 3. In early RU, it was an effective check to the dangerous Barrascuta. Then, after that rose to OU, Lantern's focus became answering Alolan Raichu instead, which it did well. However, Alolan Raichu eventually started losing steam, partially because it was stuffed quite reliably by Lantern, and started getting replaced by special attackers Lantern couldn't handle, like Ndidi and Rotom Mo. As a result, Lantern was a less effective special wall, partially because it was such a good special wall to begin with. It could still handle dangerous Pokemon like Antelian, Salazzle, and Charizard, but so could Vaporeon, which was much better if Lantern's Alolan Raichu checking abilities weren't needed. Since they no longer were, Lantern's usage dropped and it found itself in NU. There, it was quite excellent once again. It was the best water in the tier, completely stifling a ton of threats, including three different forms of Rotom, Base, Fan, and Frost. It also effortlessly sat in front of Magneton and Basculin, which were otherwise quite effective at blasting huge holes into teams. As such, Lantern was the linchpin of many teams' defensive backbones, holding them together against the these enormous threats. As always, once it was in, it spammed Volt Switch with effortless abandon, since the tier's popular ground types, Galarian, Stunfisk, and Piloswine, didn't want to come anywhere near its Scald. Lantern's NU excellence didn't last, unfortunately. It retained a nice niche for its ability to take on great Pokemon like Cramorant, Jellicent, and Rotom, but once Ninjask took over the tier and development shaped around it, Lantern's defensive utility was more limited, as it matched up much worse against the newly popular Pokemon in the tier. Most notably, it wasn't much of a stop in newly popular special attackers Duraludon and Rebombi. It was still decent, but a far cry from the status it had enjoyed previously, and its usage suffered accordingly, dropping it to PU. There, it was also quite good. Its defensive profile was as great as ever. It took on a ton of top-tier terrors like Charizard, Togedemaru, Jellicent, and even Vikavolt, while turning these defensive switches into offensive opportunities for its teammates by virtue of Volt Switch. This let it fit on offensive teams, plugging their defensive holes without giving up the momentum they relied on. It wasn't without competition, most notably from Wishy Washy, which was also an effective bulky water that pivoted its teammates in nicely. But, Lantern's unique defensive profile ensured it always had a legitimate role in the tier. Finally, though Lantern was not a UU Pokemon, it did see its first legitimate, albeit very small, niche in the tier since Generation 4. Thunderous Therian was one of the biggest threats to UU stall, and Lantern completely dominated it. Its low weight meant it took minimal damage even from Grass Knot. It was additionally effective as a counter to both Rotom Heat and Rotom Wash, stifling any Volt Switch or Nasty Plot antics they might want to attempt, and it of course provided amazing utility in its status curing Heal Bell. Lantern was a highly specific choice even on stall, so its overall niche was minuscule but it did have that niche, and it was legitimate. So how good was Lantern actually? Throughout its history, wherever it's ended up, Lantern has excelled in the lower tiers. OU has mostly eluded it, bar one glorious burst of viability in post-Generation 3, but that's just fine because Lantern has used its unique superb traits to the fullest in each lower tier ever since its introduction in Generation 2. Its competitive history is a rich combination of defense and offense, with the former feeding the latter. All in all, Lantern's had a great run. Thank you for watching, thank you to False Swipe for having me, and check out my channel, which is a guaranteed good time if you like these types of videos.